So, next speaker, Markus Denker, talking about Faro 3. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Faro 3, which is uh, the next uh, release of Faro. And um, before I uh, show you what uh, actually Faro 3, uh, what we did, and what it will be, a bit in general about it. So you have already seen uh, Faro already uh, in the first talk, which was already Faro 3, because uh, the release is uh, very soon, and so people are starting to use the, the latest now. So what is Faro? Faro is a language and an environment, where uh, the environment means a full programming language, uh, programming envi environment, with uh, code editor, debugger, and everything. It's a simple language, small talk, right now uh, very much compatible to the original small talk. Uh, and it's object oriented, it's dynamic, and especially it's extremely uh, reflective. So that means it's implemented in itself and you can change and inspect everything uh, of the language directly. So the idea actually is that we want to build the ultimate programming environment. So of course a lofty goal and we will see how it turns out, but that's the end, uh, end goal. So Faro is MIT license. Our main platforms are Mac, Linux, and Windows. There are some people looking at uh, mobile, uh, mobile space, but that's a bit difficult because they don't allow JIT compilation to be done, and so that means it's a bit slow. Uh, we have a growing and uh, really nice community. Uh, very important, Faro is improving steadily. So actually, there is almost no day uh, where there is not something being improved. Often it's, of course, very simple, but sometimes it's big. And we have a lot of uh, libraries and external projects that use Faro, like we saw in the first talk, for example, this baby mock project. So Faro was started in 2008, uh, but we had our first release only uh, relatively late in 2009, in October. And since then, uh, we had all in all five releases, uh, which uh, 2.0 is the stable, which was released last March. So last year's uh, talk here at FOSTEM was actually about what we had done for Faro 2 and that we would release it soon. And the interesting thing is that we managed to do almost everything or most of the things that we were actually planning for Faro 3. The idea is that we want to do one release per year for the next 20 years or something like that. So um, that means that uh, we, yeah, well, I, I will later with Faro, in the Faro 4 talk, I will discuss a bit what that means from a time schedule. So we started in March uh, 2013. We, um, if you look at the bug tracker and you filter for all uh, issue tracker entries tagged Faro 3, then you, re then you see that it's 2021 that were closed since March. This is quite a lot, so that means these are, this is not even uh, 300 days, and that means these are really multiple uh, things happening every day. So when people uh, submit an uh, an issue tracker fix, then this fix is automatically verified uh, by running all tests. And then we combine three, four of those into a so-called update, of which we have around one, two, three per day. And we made, since uh, March 18th last year, we had 733 updates for Faro 3. Um, so that means a lot of things happened, and we still have a bit to do. So we have 14 is 40 issues tagged that we need to fix until we can release, but we hope that we will do that until uh, March. Lots of, lots of activity means, um, so this graph I made in December, so it's already a bit outdated. Um, the, this is the release date of RO2, and this is uh, shortly before Christmas. And you, you can see that uh, the open issues stay more or less constant. So we have always a constant open issue of around 500, between 450 and 550 issues. And it's really difficult to get, get that down. So I always try, and we always have sprints where we try to get this down, but it's very difficult. But the interesting thing is it stays constant. So even so, uh, people open a lot of issue tracker entries. Um, it, uh, they, they get close. So we managed to close 2,000 issue tracker entries uh, w within the development of uh, Faro 3. And um, one of the reasons why we were able to move uh, so much faster than in the past is that we now have a working uh, continuous integration infrastructure. So this is actually provided by INRIA, which is a French uh, a government research lab for computer science. And they have a central um, 
uh, continuous integration infrastructure built on Jenkins. And we can use that to build up our infrastructure, and we use that extremely a lot. So that means every fix that someone submits is validated automatically for the latest version of Faro, latest development version, which means it runs, in this case, only on Linux, all um, 16,000 tests. And only if these tests are green, this issue will get tagged to be a birth of human review. And we run even a kind of lint style uh, uh, checks to see. So for example, if someone forgets to put a comment in a class, so if there are certain small errors, they, they are checked automatically too. So that we do for every uh, fix. And then when, when an update happens of Faro itself, this update is validated on, on all three architectures automatically so that it runs all those 16,000 tests three times. Um, and of course, after that, there is a new version of Faro, and that means that all uh, issues that have been already checked to be uh, reviewed, they will be retested. So that means we have a lot of uh, activity going on on this integration infrastructure. Uh, one update push of Faro triggers a lot of jobs. Once to rerun all the tests on the proposed, up, uh, proposed fixes, and the other thing is we have now in the Faro contribution uh, CI server over ex uh, 80 uh, external projects that uh, are validated, often on, on both Faro, Faro the stable version and the unstable version. So that means that one push of an update tr triggers directly 80 builds on the co contribution server. And the contribution server looks like this. So it's a uh, normal Jenkins installation, but with 80 uh, projects. Um, Besides the continuous integration, we, have, we build a lot of other infrastructure over the years. Most of it really got stable last year, which is very interesting, so that everything comes together and pushes you forward. So we now have a file server, files.faro.org, where you have every uh, Faro image that ever was, so the Faro release of every intermediate update is available there. So if you want to check if from the version that you used two weeks ago, if this bug really happened there and not now, and you don't have this release anymore, you can go back, there is the whole history available there. Um, we have get.faro.org, which is an easy way of installing Faro, especially in a server context. So it's a, a website with a description where you use uh, wget to directly install a complete uh, Faro uh, system. So if you go there with your, your browser, you can see how this looks like. Another one is uh, Smalltalk Hub, which is uh, a special kind of GitHub-like system for Smalltalk, which instead of using Git, uses Monticello, which is the traditional um, revision control system that was uh, invented for, for Squeak a long time ago. Um, yeah, and this one uh, starts to get quite used a lot. So we have over a thousand users, and due to our wonderful build infrastructure, we get around 15 million downloads of, of versions every day. So what did we do with all these 2,000 uh, update, uh, issues and uh, lots of updates? So we had a lot of small cleanups, of course. So when uh, the philosophy in, in Faro is that nothing is too trivial to be done. So if someone, while reading code, finds a typo, of course that is not really relevant for anyone. I mean, a typo, missing I in a comment. Who cares? But people actually, when they read that, they actually stumble and say, yeah, someone should fix that. And if they then do the work to fix it, we will integrate it. So there is no, oh, but this is trivial, we will ignore it. There are lots of, uh, of course, code-based uh, tunings, like uh, performance improvements, memory uh, consumption improvements, especially because we managed to get a couple of memory leaks in, uh, in some uh, things. There were a lot of imp improvements in Faro 3. And overall, lots of small improvements on the code base. So we have now a, a, a lint style a checker in the system that provides a, a couple of, I guess, around 80 or so checks of things that should never be wrong. So for example, if there is an instance variable that nobody uses, why is it there? It just makes people think of, why do you need this kind of state in this class? And then people do not understand anymore, and then they search around, and they find, oh, it's not used, and they lost 10 minutes of their life. So we are trying to Im improve all these small things. So lots of things were done there. Um, but of course, there were a lot of larger improvements too. And uh, not a lot of them I can go into detail. So these are actually the ones I will not talk about. So for example, uh, we uh, added the, the closure class of, uh, that used to be in, in Seaside, 
we added that into the system, so now you have a closure uh, that you implementation that you can use directly without loading C side. Uh, we have now a real terminal output for standard error on, for, for uh, Unix, very nice. We cleaned up a lot of code related to source files. We have an AST interpreter now in the system that allows you to uh, very nicely experiment with Smalltalk-like systems by changing it. It's a visitor over the abstract syntax tree, very simple but complete, so it can actually run uh, the whole tests successfully. Um, we added lots of AST related things, so for example there's AST based navigation in the browser so that you don't um, in the code browsers or in the editors, or you don't need to uh, go character by character, but you can say, okay, uh, go to the next uh, AST uh, abstraction, go to the next statement. We added a nice commit tool, uh, uh, lots of small speed ups and things like that. Yeah. Yes? Continuation not totally huh? You meant continuation not totally right? Which one? The first bullet. What? Closure. Yeah. Continuation. Ah, continuation. Yeah, you're right. Continuation class. Blocks are closures, but if you want to program with continuations, you always needed to do it yourself, and this simplifies. So one of the bigger improvements that are actually visible to the to the users, or if you download Faro, is the new inspector. And I actually want to uh, show you that quickly if I have the time. So what does the clock say? I guess. Minutes. Okay, so let's quickly uh, take the latest furrow and start it up. Done. Mm -hmm. So if you if you're in furrow, there there is the or well in, in morphic in general, not only in furrow, you have this the whole uh, what models the screen is actually an object that is bound to a global variable called world, and you can of course inspect that variable. And so you get an in inspector, and th you see that this inspector looks a little bit different than the, or if you know uh, older small talks, you see that it's a little bit different because it has a selector uh, at, the, at the top, which allows you to switch which kind of inspector you want to use. So uh, small talk already since, I think, small talk 80, since original release, had the concept of multiple kinds of uh, inspectors, but it was always a bit hidden. So normal end user programmers even didn't understand that when they looked at the dictionary that this was a special inspector that was not showing the real world but how it would look like that it looks dictionary like and we made this now available as so that you see that there are multiple kinds of inspectors for certain objects and for these morph objects we now have always four different inspectors available one that is the standard inspector one is a tree inspector which is what used to be the explorer which shows you uh, every, all the state of this object nicely in a tree then we have a hierarchy explorer, which only shows you the morph objects and the hierarchy that the graphical things have on screen. So you can see, okay, this is a spec window and it has a grip morph and all these, these things. And then we have, uh, just as a demo, something really fun, which just shows the, this uh, graphical morph and renders it inside the, the browser. And as this, of course, renders what you see on screen, you get a really nice effect of uh, an endless inspector of the of the main screen, and if you, if you open now here a, a menu, then this will immediately be uh, copied step by step into the into this. So it's kind of fun. Will this run out of memory? No, because it just renders the. I think it stops at some point or something like that. I think it has a maximum depth. So kind of nice. And uh, this, this new inspector actually has already been proven to be very uh, interesting. So it is uh, used a lot in our virtual machine experiments to um, give us special inspectors for uh, past trees, intermediate representations, and uh, showing, so there is work going on on uh, adaptive optimization, which will be uh, very interesting. And we hope that we will see something end of, around the end of the year working, uh, which the benchmarks you saw that Stefan showed, which will hopefully be improved a little bit for, for Koch together with this uh, optimizer. And there it's very useful to have this inspector because you can inspect all these things, these uh, SSA graphs that get optimized. You can in in introspect very nicely. 
So that's very nice. Another thing that we are working on, but which uh, is a big project, is uh, a vector graphics backend that should replace the 70 70 style bitmap graphics that drives uh, the system right now. So it's a new API for vector graphics, modern API, with uh, independent backends. So now we use Cairo. Um, there is a Balloon 3D bug backend for debugging, but it's because Balloon 3D is not complete in the sense of a complete uh, vector framework, it's not really useful, cannot do some certain things. And in the future, we would like to directly go to OpenGL and use hardware rendering. But for now, it's Cairo. And we actually have this working in, in the current uh, 3.0, there's a preview. It's uh, not yet used to render the desktop, because that is a lot of more work uh, to be done. But it, it, it works already like this, kind of nice. So how is this called? Tiger... V Tiger demo run demo, I guess. Yes. So you can see here, this is a um, lots of shapes. For, for the vector data, and this is rendered uh, for f uh, to make this relatively smooth animation all the time completely, while being copied around as a bitmap quite a lot. So to get this into the morphic screen, it gets copied again, and there's a lot of copying going on, and that's why it's not that really that fast, but it works. And people are starting to use that as a specialized canvas inside uh, Faro 3. Um, but the future will be to actually replace the canvas that renders the whole desktop with this uh, graphics framework, and then we would have uh, a ve vector-based system completely, where we could easily implement um, zoom of, of, of this, uh, so that when you have higher resolution that the graphics do not get smaller and all these things. And of course it should speed up the whole system quite a lot if we do that. So. That's quite nice. So in Faro 3 we have uh, a canvas for that that you can use in your programs, but the system itself does not yet use the canvas to do the rendering of the desktop. So then we actually did a lot of big changes in Faro 3 that are completely invisible. So one is that we replaced the Smalltalk compiler, so the compiler that takes text and makes bytecode. That was completely replaced by a re-implementation which uses the uh, abstract syntax tree from our tools, which is very high level, so it has lots of uh, things for, um, so it, it was actually implemented for a refactoring tool, and now we use it in the compiler, which is quite kind of interesting, gives you a lot of flexibility. And then it uses the back end, which is kind of like a high level assembly for uh, bytecode, which is very nicely usable standalone if you want to do experiments, and you can actually decompile uh, the whole system into uh, this intermediate representation manipulated and then we emit a bytecode and that's extremely fast. So decompiling the whole system takes less than a second using the IR representation. But it's very nice if you want to do bytecode manipulation. Uh, all in all, the compiler is much easier to change because it's built on, on visitors, one after the other. Um, and it really you the basis for a lot of really nice things that you will see in Faro 4, which we will see later. A bit on the same level is that we replace the class builder. The class builder is uh, a system that is there when you want to make a class, because making a class is not that simple, because if there are already instances, you need to migrate the instances. Uh, there are different kinds of classes, so it's, it's quite, quite a lot of work to be done. And the class builder was really complicated, so actually I don't think that anyone understood it. Um, and now we replace it with a class builder that is um, much easier to understand and much more flexible because it makes a lot of things into objects that weren't objects before. And one of them is so-called slots. So now we have for every instance rebel in the system, we have an object that describes that instance rebel. Right now it's purely for uh, the same that it is in Smalltalk, so it's an instance rebel, but you have an object for it, but it's kind of nice. So if you, if you look, for example, in the current Faro 3 and you say slot all instances size, then you see that we have right now in the system 7,272 different instance variables. So for every instance variable, we have now an object. And uh, in, in the second step, this will allow us to do a lot of really crazy stuff, which we will see a little bit in the Faro 4 presentation. Uh, on the same level, we have a complete new implementation of the debugger, which now separates the view from the model, and we have even two views implemented, so we can prove that it's independent. The model is scriptable, so you can actually script it using Smalltalk. It's understandable, so you can actually hack it. Uh, and um, there is a lot of nice research going on in, in Switzerland, in Bern, 
on, on this and they have really fancy debuggers. So the idea is that they want to provide your toolkit so that you can provide your own debugger for your own complicated system. So, uh, so kind of programmer implements uh, their own debugger to debug easier. Very nice. Uh, another thing that we did is command line interface. So because of the build server and because people are starting to use Faro a lot in kind of real world settings, it needs to talk better with the outside world. And one of the things that is really nice to have is a, a command line interface that makes sense. Okay. Um, so if you might make a subclass of command line handler, then you can implement, you know, just look at it, it takes two minutes to do, then you can implement your own command line handler. So I did one last week, which is called clean, which runs image cleaner. Um, and it's really nice because this one now can be used in the um, build server quite, uh, quite nicely. So you can just say uh, Faro update and then it loads the up code update. You can print version and prints out the version and then Jenkins can use that. Or if, for example, we can run the tests from the command line, which is used in the build server, of course. Uh, you can do image cleanup or you can just evaluate uh, small talk expression. Very nice. Um, so that was already about the small talk system itself. And a bit on the infrastructure level, but not technical infrastructure, but more human infrastructure, we are um, starting to do a lot of things too. So one idea that we made real last year too, so it's part of Faro 3, is the Faro Consortium. And there the idea is that there are companies using Faro for their work, and um, there should be infra uh, an infrastructure set up so that they can actually in invest into their own future. Because if Faro, uh, if they use Faro for their day-to-day -day work, then there should be interest that bugs get fixed, that things get improved, and that we move forward in general. And if you are a company, then you always need to do the things that you need to do to get your customers happy, so you, do, you don't have the time to do that at all. Sometimes you have, but often not. And so the idea here is that the uh, companies can actually uh, give money to one organization, and that organization should be able, at some point, to hire someone full-time to um, fix bugs in, in Faro, so that they don't have to do that themselves. Right now, we have 13 uh, members that are, in, uh, that are real companies. We have six academic partners and three sponsors. So sponsorship is the kind of, you're not a member, but you're, but you're contributing. And uh, it's not yet enough to pay uh, someone uh, full time, but it's already quite on a good direction. So we will hope that this will continue uh, in 2014. And here are the companies that are right now a member. Uh, sadly, our sponsors are cut off a little bit. So have a look on the website uh, to see them. Um, yeah, very nice. And this is really going in, in a good direction. So originally we wanted to have both companies and individuals being part of the consortium, but the problem is that the consortium is managed by INRIA, and INRIA as a government entity was not able to handle uh, individual contributions. Um, and so we decided for now to split these two things. So we have a consortium for companies and institutions, and we have an association for individuals, which has now around 60 members. And the idea is that at some point the consortium and association may be merged into one entity. We will see in a couple of years. Another thing that we did is um, we uh, released the second book, which has more, so we have already the Faro by example book, which needs to be updated because it uses Faro 1.1, I think, as, as an example. Uh, and we now have more advanced topics in the second book. So it's not really for in introductory things, but it's more things on top of Faro, like external libraries that are described, like ORASA, the visualization engine, things like that, or really deep topics, like I think there was something about exceptions and things like that. Oh, they're implemented, how they work. Um, yeah, and there is a third book in preparation. If someone is interested to write something, uh, that's always uh, interesting. And the third book will be about Faro in the enterprise, so more like what, uh, what do you need to, to know if you want to deploy Faro professionally? Or what kind of libraries do you have that you need in, 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 a, in this uh, world? Um, before I stop, one interesting thing we are trying to do is to have sprints regularly. And sprints are that, that we meet with 10 to 20 people with the goal to fix boring bugs. So to really look at the bug tracker and fix all the things that nobody ever wanted to do because it just sounded boring or complicated and not that important and things like that. 
And this started to get really uh, efficient. So the last sprint, we managed to fix 30 bucks uh, um, before Christmas. Uh, so that starts to get really nice. And we do try to do it uh, in many places. So if you want to organize one, you're welcome. Of course, in Lille, we, do, we try to do one every month. Uh, not all of them are really publicly announced, but around every two or three months, we want to make a really big one with external partic participation. Uh, and if there are, for example, conferences, then we try to set something up. Um, but everyone can do that if, if you're interested. So that's my presentation for Faro 3. And if you're interested, help is always welcome. I will uh, present what we will do after uh, Faro 3 until next FOSTEM, <laughs> uh, then uh, after the break. Any questions? Yes, um, you, um, maybe that was already done for FIRO 2. Uh, uh, I have to admit I had not the time to, to look at FIRO 3 uh, until now, but um, like, um, as I remember, the packaging about this in the system it was very connected, every package to each other. Uh, the, has this been resolved like with FARO 2 or FARO Yeah, 3? so we started to work on that. Okay. And uh, so there, there was a few, uh, very interesting two pro pro projects. One is about bootstrapping FARO from source code, okay. which I will talk a little bit in FARO 4. And the other one is about shrinking FARO down. And those projects, as people were working on that, they submitted improvements. So I think we improved a little bit the situation, okay. but the problem is we have not yet infrastructure in place to make sure that it does not degenerate anymore. Okay. And so there were, so when, when we then said, okay, now Faro 3 is nearly finished, some people were actually looking at, at these things and then said, hey, but this is getting not better, but even worse than it used to be. So in Faro 4, we need to really build infrastructure. We need to test that there are no, because it's so easy. You, you uh, fix something and, uh, Two weeks later, someone else said, yeah, but you are using now in the yeah. kernel this package, and this is a problem. And yeah. then you think, yeah. yeah, but I didn't know. Yeah. So it, it's really a problem. It's a good, uh, ongoing work then. Ongoing work, but there will be, I think, a lot of progress in FARO 4, because now multiple yeah. people actually said, oh, we need to do something. And that um, should be based on the packaging system that was already there from the beginning, maybe? Or yes. is, are there ideas to use so something else? So for the for the real um, yeah we, we need at some point a real package system with imports and all these things but this is a bit difficult to get it right so it's e very easy to get it wrong and that is always the danger so that we are a bit reluctant of saying okay this is the solution and then it's wrong that we will see so at some point this will come and we need to do experiments the first thing I think we will do is to put rules into place that check these things so that. We def define this is the kernel, and if the kernel uses something that's not the kernel, then the oh, test okay. is right. So that we need we need to add, and I think we will do that in Faro 4. Oh, thanks. No. Any other question? Thank you very much. <laughs> we now have half an hour.